All right, everybody. If you are watching this video, it means that I was not able to get out of jury duty, and therefore uh, Dr. Lahutsky or Dr. McMahon are actually proctoring this class, and you're getting me sort of secondhand. We're going to make the best of this. It's not an ideal situation, uh, but um, it is what it is. So. Uh, we need to talk about Paul and uh, what Paul believed, uh, some of the major elements of his teaching. So let's start by giving a little bit of a brief review of what we talked about before we went on Christmas, uh, pardon me, Thanksgiving vacation. We're not that far along yet. Um, before we went on Thanksgiving vacation, and hope you had a good Thanksgiving. Uh, so anyway, what, what did we talk about, about Paul's life? and his biography. First of all, his Hebrew name was Saul or Shaul and his Latin name was Paul or Paulus. Uh, his uh, grandfather, great-grandfather, probably a prisoner of war uh, when Pompey uh, came in and conquered Judea back around 60 BC. Uh, he inherited Roman citizenship through that. Uh, his grandfather, great-grandfather, whoever it was who was a slave and a prisoner of war, probably uh, slave to uh, a Roman citizen, uh, which would have come to him whenever he was freed and then come down to Paul via inheritance. So Saul was Paul, was raised uh, as a Pharisee. He says in Philippians chapter 3 that he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. And he was brought up in the Greco Roman city of Tarsus, which is in modern day Turkey. Uh, sometime around 35 or 40, he was converted, had some sort of visionary experience with the risen Jesus Christ on his way to Damascus or in and around Damascus. And after that, he and Barnabas and then he and Silas or Silvanus uh, went on three missionary journeys uh, in Western Asia Minor, Minor <laughs> modern day Turkey, uh, up into Macedonia and down into Greece. Uh, after his third missionary journey, he went to Jerusalem to take a collection of money for uh, the poor Christians in Jerusalem. He was arrested there on charges of having brought Gentiles into the certain restricted areas of the temple. Uh, the Roman governor knew that he had brought a lot of money to Jerusalem and so therefore held him hoping to get uh, some sort of bribe to let him go and after a couple of years in confinement he actually ended up appealing to Caesar because he was a Roman citizen, he had that right. He appealed to Caesar, asked for Caesar to hear his case. He was sent to Rome where he was placed under house arrest. He had some freedom of movement, so it wasn't like he was in some dark, dank dungeon, uh, but he was not allowed to leave the city anyway. Uh, waiting for his appeal. What exactly happened to him after that? We're not sure. Was he released, uh, acquitted, and had some freedom of movement, engaged in some additional missionary work after that, at which time he was rearrested and then martyred sometime around 65? Or did he remain in prison uh, or under confinement in some way for the next three, four, five years and uh, then martyred sometime around 65? It's hard to know. Uh, there's really not any good, solid, reliable church tradition, and we don't have any good historical evidence outside of some sort of church tradition, so it's hard to tell. But sometime around 65, uh, Paul is beheaded uh, for being a Christian in Rome under Nero. That seems fairly well established. So that's kind of a review of what we discussed as far as uh, Paul's biography is concerned. We talked about these three missionary journeys that he went on. Acts presents them as three distinct missionary journeys. I don't know if Paul would have understood um, quite so clearly that he went on three missionary journeys. Uh, but while he's on these missionary journeys and then in his subsequent uh, imprisonment in Rome, he writes letters to the churches that he founded on these missionary journeys. Now, it wasn't the case that he would go around to um, these different areas and establish churches and then just kind of leave them. Excuse me. All right, there we go. It wasn't the case that he just founds these churches and leaves them. He stays in close contact with these churches after he's established them and he uh, moves along. Uh, 
he sends uh, emissaries, co-workers to uh, visit these churches after he's left them to keep tabs on things, stay in close communication with them. They send him letters. He sends letters back to them. And so in that way, Paul stays in fairly constant and close communication with these communities that he has founded. Uh, at least constant as, and close as far as that particular culture uh, would have considered constant and close. So all the while that he's roaming around the Eastern Mediterranean, he's writing letters, he's sending his co-workers to and from the churches that he had founded, and that way he's staying in contact with them. The letters that Paul has left to us uh, are typically what we would call occasional letters. So it's not the case that Paul is writing these sort of long teachings, these sort of theology books, so to speak, where he's explaining different beliefs to his churches. He's actually hearing about different problems that they're having or different questions that they have. Uh, those questions and concerns could come to him through letters that the church has sent uh, or uh, they could come through the, the emissaries that he sends back and forth. Titus was one of the, the main guys that he uses to go to churches, find out what the problem is, come back, report, and go back with some sort of solution. But most of Paul's letters are um, prompted by some sort of problem that he's experiencing or that his churches are experiencing. So uh, in his letters, what you most often find are... Uh, him talking about issues, problems, negative things that are going on within the churches he's founded. He's trying to offer them some sort of solution that's based on these new Christian teachings, his theology, so to speak. So whenever we ask, what is it that Paul believed, we can't just simply uh, go in and uh, parse out in some sort of systematic way everything that Paul thought because he communicated it to us in that sort of systematic, clearly communicated, I'm doing theology type of way. We have to go in and tease out his theology from the way he solves these problems that his churches have. So as we ask these larger questions, what was it that Paul believed? What was it that he taught about Jesus Christ? We're going to have to do that by virtue of going into these letters where he's talking about problems, look at his solutions to these problems and ask ourselves, what's the underlying theology that's, that's motivating this particular solution? So, some major themes from Paul, and we're going to be bouncing around a lot in Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, and Galatians. So go ahead and get turned there in your Bibles and be ready to kind of move back and forth between those four books. That's where we'll spend most of our time today. Whenever I think of Paul and, and major themes in Paul, the, the first thing that comes to mind for me is Paul's concept of a new covenant. Now that's not what a lot of people will jump to immediately, but sort of the overarching theme of what Paul has to say, why Paul does what he does, how he understands what it is that Jesus has done, is in terms of the establishment of a new covenant. The old Mosaic Covenant, Paul now sees as outmoded, failed to some degree, and replaced by a new covenant that has been established in Jesus Christ. So for Paul, the old covenant has passed away, the Mosaic Covenant, and in Jesus a new covenant has been established. And one of the places that you really clearly see that is in 1 Corinthians 11. So go ahead and flip over to 1 Corinthians 11. I'll read it to you here in just a moment. What's nice about 1 Corinthians 11 is that we also get to see not just an element of Paul's understanding of Christianity as a new covenant. And Paul never uses the term Christianity, by the way. Um, but we also get to see how he's doing his theology in the context of a problem that's going on within the church. So we'll talk about Paul's idea of the new covenant here, but we'll, we'll do it in the context of sort of springboarding off of a problem that was going on uh, within the Corinthian church. And I've mentioned that they were problem children, and here's a, a really good example of that. So 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 
uh, verses 17 through uh, verse uh, 26. Now in the following instructions I do not commend you because when you come together it is not for the better but for the worse. For to begin with when you come together as a church I hear that there are divisions among you and to some extent I believe it. Indeed there have to be factions among you for only so will it become clear who among you are genuine. When you come together it's not really to eat the Lord's Supper. For when the time comes to eat each of you goes ahead with your own supper. One goes hungry and another becomes drunk. What? Do you not have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you show contempt for the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What should I say to you? Should I commend you? In this matter, I do not commend you. Okay, so let's set up what Paul is about to say by talking about this problem that he's addressing. Exactly what early Christian church services looked like, we can't really say with entire certainty. What Paul seems to be implying here is that the Corinthian church is coming together to celebrate the Lord's Supper. So to remember the last supper that Jesus had uh, with his disciples. To eat bread and to drink wine as a way of commemorating Jesus' death. But in the Corinthian church, when they're doing that, apparently each family or group is bringing their own food and wine to the meal in some way or another so that instead of having one large Lord's Supper together it seems like what they're doing is individuals or families or groups factions within the Corinthian church are celebrating the Lord's Supper in some way by themselves rather than communally as a group those who have plenty are bringing plenty with them and whenever you have plenty of wine at the Lord's Supper, you get plenty drunk. And those who do not have enough are actually eating the Lord's Supper and going away hungry. So the idea behind this particular celebration of the Lord's Supper seems to have been that it was an actual meal. And Paul is unhappy about the inequities that he sees, the abuses that are going on where people are being irreverent and drinking to the point of excess. And he rebukes them says this is not what is supposed to be going on in the Lord's Supper. So there's the problem. His solution is to remind uh, the Corinthian Christians of how the Lord's Supper was actually established. You remember we talked about this particular passage a little bit in regard to uh, multiple attestation with regards to the historical Jesus. Whenever you see the same story repeated in more than one independent source, you have multiple attestation with the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper, the meal that Jesus had with his disciples the night before he was crucified. Uh, you have that in the Synoptics, you have that in John, and now you have it here in Paul. So here we go, verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you do this in remembrance of me. In the same way he took the cup also after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So Paul solves the problem by reminding the Corinthian Christians, at least that's part of how he solves it. There's more that he says, but that's not my main focus right now. He begins to solve the problem of the abuses of the Lord's Supper uh, that the Corinthians are engaging in by reminding them of the fact that this, this is the establishment of a new covenant. It was a solemn occasion where Jesus gives the bread and gives the wine and tells his disciples that this is his body and his blood and that this symbolizes the new covenant which is made in his body and blood or through his body and blood. So in this chapter you get to see, or in this section I guess I should say, you get to see uh, Paul addressing a problem within the Corinthian church, as I've told you that is the case with his letters. He's addressing that problem by communicating to them a tradition and a theology. This theology is that Jesus by dying established a new covenant with the people of God. Now obviously what that's also going to mean is that the old covenant, the Mosaic covenant, is 
somehow and for some reason going to be set aside. So let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's carry on just a little bit. Let's flip back to Romans chapter 3. So the book just before 1 Corinthians. Romans chapter 3. We're going to look at verses 21 through 26. Now Romans is a little bit different for Paul in that Romans really does seem to be there's some argument about it, but Romans really does seem to be an attempt to um, articulate to some degree Paul's theology. It's not necessarily being prompted by a particular problem within the Roman church. Paul did not establish the Roman church. We don't know who established the Roman church. Uh, what Paul is trying to do in Romans is actually trying to get them to support a mission that he's planning for Spain. But he doesn't seem to know of any particular problems within the Roman church like he does with the Corinthian church. So with Romans, he's really more kind of setting out what it is that he thinks about what Jesus means. And we're really going to start encountering that here in this particular section. Paul spent a couple of chapters putting all of humanity under judgment. He's done a, a few things rhetorically that uh, are meant to convince his hearers that everyone has sinned, Jew and Gentile alike, whether you're under the law or whether you're a pagan who worships false gods, you don't please God like you are supposed to. So what's the solution? In verse 21, chapter 3, Paul says, But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets. In other words, the law looked ahead and foretold what God is now going to do outside of the law. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are now justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by His blood, effective through faith. He did this to show his righteousness, because in his divine forbearance he had passed over the sins previously committed. It was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous and that he justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. There's a whole lot in that passage, and we could spend a lot of time talking about different elements of it. What I want to draw your attention to is that language of Jesus as an atoning sacrifice. That is the language of the Day of Atonement, the one day of the year that the high priest entered into the temple in Jerusalem, took in uh, the blood of a sacrificial animal and sprinkled it on top of the Ark of the Covenant, or during the Second Temple period when there was no Ark of the Covenant, sprinkled it within the Holy, Holy of Holies. All of that is indicative of Paul thinking in terms of Jesus as the sacrifice that establishes or makes effective a new covenant. So the old covenant uh, made by God with the people of Israel through Moses, we saw in the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, with all of the laws, with all of the ceremonies, with all of the sacrifices, with all of the festivals. Paul is essentially considering that as having been superseded by what Jesus Christ has done. Not that the law was bad, but that the law could not do everything that it was supposed to do. One last, one last passage of scripture and then we'll move on to the next idea that we'll take a look at. And that's 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. Just one quick verse, but that again reveals a lot about how Paul thinks about what Jesus has done. Clean out the old yeast, so that you may be a new batch, as you really are unleavened. For our Paschal Lamb, Christ, has been sacrificed. Paschal means Passover Lamb. So in Romans, Paul talks about Jesus as the sacrifice on the Day of Atonement. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, he talks about Jesus as the Passover Lamb. We have to remember that the Passover Lamb is the... It is its own kind of sacrifice. It's done in the home. Remember, it kept the death angel from coming into the homes of the Israelites and killing the firstborn just before they were released from captivity in Egypt so that they could go to Mount Sinai and engage in this new covenant with God, this Mosaic covenant. 
So just like that Passover lamb makes possible the covenant under Moses, Jesus Christ, Paul says, is like a Passover lamb who makes possible a new covenant with God. So we've seen this new covenant associated with Jesus' death Paul also associates the New Covenant with Jesus' resurrection. So let's unpack that a little bit more. There's a New Covenant that has come about because Jesus has died and because Jesus has risen from the dead. How does Paul conceive of all of that? What is Paul thinking whenever he says all of this? First of all, we need to understand that Paul thinks of Jesus as God. Now, it's, it's not entirely accurate to say that Paul thinks of Jesus as divine. It's not enough, I would say, to, to argue that Paul thinks of Jesus as divine. Paul doesn't simply think of Jesus as divine. Paul, Paul thinks of Jesus as, in some way, an embodiment or a personification of the God of the Old Testament. Now let me walk you through that. In the Old Testament, a central tenet of Jewish belief is that there is one God and only one God. In Deuteronomy, you have what's called the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And yet Paul speaks about Jesus in terms that are clearly and unambiguously identifying him with the God of the Old Testament. How do we know that? Let me kind of walk you through something. Several times in Paul's letters, he refers to Jesus Christ as Lord. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Or he refers to Jesus as Lord Jesus Christ. For us, I think that Christ sticks out more. Lord, probably to our minds a lot of times when we first see that, just it's, it's just kind of a, it's an acknowledgement of Jesus' power. Uh, he's really special. But we don't necessarily think of that as, as identifying Jesus as God, right? But let's stop and consider the history of that word, the Jewish history of that word. We learned that Back in the Old Testament, the divine name of God, the revealed name of God, the covenant name of God, is Yahweh. Y-H-W-H. The Jews were very, or became, very uncomfortable with saying that word, pronouncing that word. So, a lot of times, whenever they were reading the scriptures out loud, and they came to Yahweh, they would substitute some other word in order to avoid saying Yahweh. Now, one of the things that they would say was Hashem, which just means the name. So whenever they're reading along and they come to the name, they just call it the name. Uh, and you'll, in a modern Jewish context, you'll still hear some conservative, observant Jews refer to God as Hashem, not, not as God, but as Hashem. Another thing that came to be substituted for Yahweh was the uh, Hebrew word Adonai, which Greek translators, whenever they're translating the Septuagint, the Jewish scholars who translated the Hebrew Old Testament into Greek, uh, took that Hebrew word Adonai and they brought it right into the Greek as Kyrios. Adonai and Kyrios roughly translate into English as Lord. So whenever you're reading through the Old Testament and you come across Lord, all in caps, that's a way for our English translators to indicate to you that what's actually there is Yahweh. When you see in the New Testament the word Lord, the Greek word there is Kyrios. Kyrios is the word that these Greek-speaking Jews used to substitute for the name of Yahweh. So what I would argue, and I think I'm on good ground whenever I argue this, is that when Paul refers to Jesus as Lord, 
Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is Lord. He is explicitly connecting Jesus to the God of the Old Testament. He is saying Jesus Christ is in some way Yahweh. It's not simply that he's divine. He is in some way Yahweh. So Paul, as I understand it, believes in what Christians later called the Incarnation. The idea that God becomes a human being in some way. And yet God is still out there in heaven or wherever controlling things, managing things, making sure that the universe operates like it's supposed to. So in that way Paul, even if he doesn't have an understanding of what Christians would later call the Trinity, he certainly has an understanding of God as having two different manifestations that occur at the same time. Jesus is Yahweh here on earth during his time on earth. And at the same time there is some other aspect or element of God that is the Father that's in heaven while Jesus is on earth. Paul's main idea is not to tease, tease out what all of that means. That's not a big problem for him just yet. It will become something that Christians have to really think through later on. But for Paul, Jesus is God. Jesus is Yahweh. And yet, at the same time, Jesus is fully human. Jesus is a person who suffers and dies. Paul believes in the literal, physical suffering and death of Jesus Christ. So, in Paul's thought, Jesus is both God and Jesus is both human. As such, he is able to keep the law of Moses in a way that no other human being ever was able to do, able to be perfectly obedient to the will of God in a way that no other human being was able to do, and yet do it as a human being to fulfill the law. And by fulfilling the law, and then by dying, setting aside the law so that it is no longer binding, it is no longer the way that people come into covenant relationship with God. In that way, Jesus dies on behalf of human sin. So whenever Paul talks in Romans about Jesus being the atoning sacrifice, that is the sacrifice that covers over, gains forgiveness for, the sins that human beings have committed. There's no perfect single parallel in Paul's language for the idea that he's trying to express. The Passover lamb doesn't completely do it. The sacrifice on the Day of Atonement doesn't completely do it. So Paul uses both terms in order to express this one idea. Jesus is the sacrifice that atones for human sin. But it's not just Jesus' death that's important for establishing the New Covenant. It's also Jesus' resurrection. Jesus' death gains forgiveness, but Jesus' resurrection gives new life to human beings. So the death forgives sins, the life, uh, the resurrection gives life to human beings. Humanity needs to be freed from the power of sin, but what is the power of sin? For Paul, the power of sin is death. We die because we sin. In Romans, Paul talks at great length about Adam and how Adam's sin brings death into the world. The power of sin is death. So in order for Jesus, on God's behalf, to completely do away with sin, to conquer sin, uh, death has to be conquered as well. And therefore Jesus doesn't just die to atone for sins. Jesus is brought back to life in order to conquer death and ultimately to conquer sin. So in Paul's thought, the law is able to gain forgiveness of sins, but it's not able to conquer sin. In Jesus, because of the resurrection, death is conquered and therefore sin is conquered. Now I'm 
kind of gone through a lot of information really quickly. Let me kind of rehash just a little bit because you're not able to ask me questions. And I don't know that Dr. Lutsky or Dr. McMahon would entirely agree with everything that I'm saying. There's a lot of debate amongst Paul scholars and you can you can argue just about anything you want about what it was that Paul believed. So, and people of goodwill can disagree about what Paul meant. But let me recap. Paul sees the Old Covenant as able to tell us what to do, but not able to empower us to do it. Therefore, it is inadequate. God takes on human form, or actually takes on humanity, in Jesus, dies, and rises again in order to not only gain forgiveness of sins, but also to break the power of sin and to empower human beings to follow God's commandments. All of that is the new covenant that is established through Jesus that replaces the law of Moses in a nutshell. Okay, let's move on. If there's a new covenant, then what about the symbols? We've been talking about these symbols all the way through this particular course, all semester long. You have these six symbols that are built up around the Old Covenant, the Mosaic Covenant. They begin with the covenant with Abraham and they carry on into the covenant with Moses. We saw that in Jesus' ministry he starts to redefine a lot of these symbols. Paul carries forward that work of redefinition, so he doesn't just leave the symbols alone. He carries them forward into his understanding of what it means to be in this new covenant with God, to be God's new people. But he doesn't just leave those symbols alone or just carry them into this new covenant without redefining them in any way. He can't. The covenant has been redefined, therefore the symbols have to be redefined. Well, the first symbol we've already seen, Jesus Christ is Lord. Christ is the Greek word that translates the Hebrew word Mashiach, which is Messiah, right? So the Jews, as part of their covenant, have been ex expecting this Messiah, this king who will follow in David's footsteps and be like David or like Solomon in some way or another. Paul understands Jesus as fulfilling that symbol. Jesus Christ is now king, but he's not king over an earthly kingdom. He's king over the cosmos. He's king over everything. And at the end of time, which we'll call the eschaton, the, the end is what that literally means. At the end, Jesus Christ is going to come back, and we'll see that Paul expects that to happen very soon. Uh, Jesus Christ will come back and establish the kingdom of God in some way or another, whether it's on earth or in heaven, you could argue one way or the other. It seems that Paul has an idea that there will be an earthly kingdom, but it will be an eternal kingdom that's never going to pass away. It's going to be for all of God's covenant people. So Jesus Christ is the king from the house of David who has redefined what kingship means. How do you enter into the covenant? What is the sign of having entered into the covenant? Well, in the Old Covenant, that was circumcision. We noted that, interestingly enough, Jesus touches on every symbol except for circumcision. He never talks about circumcision. He doesn't redefine circumcision. He's a Jew talking to, Jewish, uh, talking to a Jewish audience. It's not a point of controversy. But for Paul, it is. Paul, Paul is working primarily amongst Gentiles. There's the question of how they relate to the law. Paul says the law has passed away. There's a new covenant in Jesus Christ. Circumcision was the sign of the old covenant. There is now a new sign for a new covenant. And that new sign is twofold. It is baptism and the Holy Spirit. We tend to think of those as being two fairly separate entities. Paul thought of baptism and the Holy Spirit as being very closely connected. Let's look at just a few 
passages very quickly and we'll be in Galatians for both of these. Uh, Galatians chapter 3, first of all. Galatians chapter 3, uh, verses 1 and following. And I'll read whenever I come to where I need to stop. I'll stop. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly exhibited as crucified. The only thing I want to learn from you is this. Did you receive the Spirit by doing the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? Having started with the Spirit, are you now ending with the flesh? Did you experience so much for nothing, if it really was for nothing? Well then, does God supply you with the Spirit and work miracles among you by your doing the works of the law or by your believing what you heard? The problem in Galatians, again we're back to problems, the problem in Galatians is that you have these Gentile believers uh, that had received the gospel as Paul preached it, which is that there is a new covenant that does not involve the law of Moses. And they accepted that. And then Paul moves along. Some Jewish Christians come along behind Paul and start teaching the Galatians that in order to fully participate in the covenant with God, they have to fully participate in the Mosaic covenant. In other words, the covenant in Jesus is not a new covenant. It's sort of a both and. It's an addition to the law of Moses. So they have to keep the law of Moses and therefore they have to be circumcised. The Galatians, interestingly enough, <laughs> are uh, or seem to be willing to undergo circumcision and participate in the law of Moses. And Paul is reacting very strongly to that. And he says, you did not come into covenant relationship with God by observing the law of Moses. That shorthand for getting circumcised. I didn't ask you to be circumcised, so were you not in covenant relationship with God all this time or what? No, you were. You started in your covenant relationship with God in the Spirit. So Paul emphasizes the reception of the Spirit as being the indicator that these people were in fact within covenant relationship with God. That's connected to baptism as well. So let's move on just a little bit. Galatians 5, 2 through 6. Listen, I, Paul, am telling you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no benefit to you. Once again, I testify to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obliged to obey the entire law. You who want to be justified by the law have cut yourselves off from Christ. Yes, there is a pun there. <laughs> uh, you have fallen away from grace, for through the Spirit, by faith, we eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything. The only thing that counts is faith working through love. Uh, I've got one more passage that I need to read, but I didn't write it down. Give me just a second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, flip back just a bit. Galatians chapter 3, verse 23. Now before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Therefore the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came, so that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian. For in Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is no longer Jew nor Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male or female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And you who belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. So we see very clearly in those first two passages that we've read this idea that it is the Spirit that brings us into new covenant with God through Jesus Christ. In this third passage that we read, it's not as closely tied to the idea of the Spirit as we'd like it to be, but you can definitely see the idea that Paul is linking baptism with entry into the covenant people of God. So for Paul, circumcision has been replaced with baptism and the reception of the Spirit. What's important about the reception of the Spirit is that it is what empowers you to live out the precepts of, of God, to actually do the works that the law told you to do, but was not able to make you do, or was not able to help you do.
So the Spirit is an empowering presence in the life of the person who has faith in Jesus. Now in that last bit that we read, that last verse, and if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. That takes us to our third, pardon me, third, uh, our third symbol that we need to discuss, and that is descendants. Now Luke had a strong emphasis on the symbol of descendants. Remember we talked about the fact that Luke kind of glosses over a lot of this symbol talk, right? Because he's a Gentile writing to Gentiles. His Gentile hearers, readers, are not going to understand a lot of the symbols that he discusses. Paul is a Jew, but he is ministering to, he is preaching to Gentiles. He's establishing churches amongst Gentiles. And therefore, it's of great concern to him to talk about this particular symbol in a way that makes sense and that's very closely connected to uh, the Old Testament. Paul thinks of his new covenant as being foreshadowed by God's covenant with Abraham and he actually connects his discussion of the new covenant in Jesus Christ with the covenant that God established through Abraham and he actually argues very extensively and we won't go into all the details it's pretty convoluted he actually argues that coming to faith in Jesus is what makes you a real descendant of Abraham. So the covenant, this whole covenant relationship idea starts way back with Abraham. There's something different done with Moses. With Jesus, there's a new covenant that's actually fulfilling the promises made in and through Abraham in a way that the Mosaic Law never could do. And so if you have faith in Jesus Christ, you are now a true descendant of Abraham. And it's not about circumcision. It's not about your genealogy and your family history and whatnot. It's about your faith and what your faith says about your covenant relationship with God. It's faith that makes you a true descendant of Abraham, a true heir to the promises that God made in and through Abraham. Temple. If you look over at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, and we won't go there, Paul basically says to the Corinthians, don't you know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? In another place he talks about each individual believer being a stone in a larger temple uh, that's being constructed for the worship of God. So Paul takes the symbol of temple that was so important in Judaism and he actually applies it to the gathered community and that's not new. We've talked about that at length. We've seen this in the life and ministry of Jesus. Jesus curses the temple uh, through the symbol of the fig tree. He establishes a community around himself where forgiveness from God is obtained through him within his community. We saw in Acts chapter 2 the fire fall from heaven on the believers symbolizing that they are in essence, the sacrifice in this new temple that God is establishing. Paul just carries all that right on through to uh, his community of believers. So he's not doing anything that we haven't already seen. The Sabbath, he doesn't explicitly rework, but he leaves off Sabbath observance. Now uh, worship is held on the first day of the week, which is Sunday. We've observed that the Sabbath technically is Friday evening to Saturday evening. For Paul, Sunday is the Sabbath. Why Sunday? Well, that's the day that Jesus rose from the dead, so it's a commemoration of the resurrection, which is so important to Paul's theology. Uh, in addition, there's probably some underlying symbolism of new creation. So you've gone beyond the one week, so to speak, of the days in which God created and then rest, rested, <laughs> and now you've moved on into a new week. So the fact that we're celebrating on the first day of the week is a way of saying we are a new creation. God is doing a new thing. This is the first day of the new week of creation. The land becomes something eschatological. We talked about the eschaton, the end. If you want to use eschaton as uh, an adjective, you say it's eschatological. So Paul has this idea that in the end, when Jesus returns, the church is in this kind of hiatus time right now, in between Jesus' first coming and Jesus' second coming, 
uh, at that second coming, Jesus is going to establish some kind of new kingdom. In 1 Thessalonians, he implies that it's, it's a heavenly thing, that believers are going to be taken up into heaven to be with Jesus. In Romans, though, he talks about creation groaning for its redemption, as though Jesus is going to come back and sort of restore and redeem creation in some way. So Paul's not terribly clear. But the land becomes an eschatological thing. The kingdom becomes somewhat spiritual. It may have to do with Jesus establishing God's kingdom on earth at the end of time, so to speak. Uh, or it may be something else. It's one of those areas where Paul's not quite as clear as I'd like him to be, but there it is. All right. How do you get into this new covenant? If, if Paul's big idea is that Jesus Christ, Lord Jesus Christ, has established a new covenant that fulfills and sets aside uh, the Mosaic Law so that you now come to covenant with God through Jesus. Well, how do you do that? How do you access this new covenant? In the Old Testament, you profess faith in the one God. Hero Israel, the Lord is one. And you went through certain sacrifices and prayers and washings and circumcision. And then you were part of the covenant. So what do you do if you are coming into this new covenant with Jesus? Paul's consistent answer is you have faith. There's nothing that you can do as far as works of the law, being circumcised, to enter into covenant with God. You have to have faith. What does that mean? I think he uses this idea of faith in three different ways. First of all, I think that Paul does have an idea of faith as a kind of creed, a statement of belief. You see it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 where Paul says, the tradition that's handed on is that Jesus Christ was crucified, he was buried, he rose again on the third day, he appeared, and then he appeared last of all. So he's got this kind of formula that sets out, these are the things that Jesus did, these are the things that happened. There are other areas where you see hymns, uh, you know, portions of early Christian songs that profess certain things about who Jesus is and what Jesus does. So for Paul, I think there is an idea that faith is a, a set of beliefs that you have to have about who Jesus is and what Jesus does. More importantly, though, for Paul, it is the actual act of believing. Now, Christians have argued for centuries whether belief in itself is a work, right? As Paul says, you don't do works to come into the covenant. You have to have faith. Well, is faith a work or is it not? Is faith something you do or is it not? We're not going to go into all of that. But Paul's basic answer is you have to believe in Jesus as your means of accessing, means of entry into the covenant. When you come to faith, then you're baptized and you receive the Holy Spirit and you are reborn. You become a new creation. You become a real heir, a real descendant of Abraham and have the promises that God gave to Abraham. I think that Paul also uses it in terms of faithfulness. He, he rebuked those difficult Galatian believers early on saying you began in the spirit are you going to come to perfection uh, by works there's this idea of faithfulness remaining faithful to the teaching that you've received remaining obedient to the example of Jesus Christ Jesus Christ's own example of faithfulness Paul talks about the faith or the faithfulness of Jesus I think that plays into it as well so Paul thinks of faith in three different ways. It's, it's a content. It's things that you have to believe. It's belief, believing these things and not just sort of giving mental assent to them. Uh, and then also remaining faithful to those teachings and to that belief. So then what about the law? What about the Old Covenant? I've said several times that Paul thinks of the Old Covenant as having been set aside in some way. Uh, how does he conceive of that? First of all, it's hopelessly complicated, so we're not going to sort out what all that means today. But just a few things. Paul sees the value 
of the law as um, a revelation of the nature and character of God. He sees the law as good, but as I said earlier, he sees the law as something that's it can tell you what to do, but it cannot make you able to do it. So you have to, on your own effort, be obedient to the law, which he argues no one can do. So you can exert all this effort trying to keep the precepts of the law, but ultimately you're going to fail. When you fail, you come under judgment, and judgment leads to death. So for Paul, ultimately, the law leads you to failure, condemnation, and death. The law is still useful because it shows us how we ought to live. But God in Christ has set aside the law as the covenant that we have with God, if that makes sense. Uh, I made that really, really simple, but I think that's good enough. All of this happens because God is just or righteous. This establishment of a new covenant, the giving of the Spirit that makes us able to keep the precepts of the law, uh, all of that happens because God is just. We looked at that chapter in Romans 3, verses 21 through about 26 or so. In 21 and 22, we get this repeated emphasis on uh, God's righteousness, I think is the way the NRSV translates it. What is righteousness? Uh, it, it, it's a really hard term to translate. Righteousness is a word that for a lot of English speakers nowadays doesn't really have any sort of meaning. I mean, we don't know what righteousness means. It sort of means holiness or doing the right thing, right? But in Paul's thought, that's something else. There's, there's holiness and then there's this other thing that often gets translated as righteousness. Some people like to translate it as God's justice. Uh, that sounds very legal, right? Uh, that makes God kind of like a, a judge, and that also puts us in a kind of a difficult position of being under God's justice, right? Um, that's not exactly the way it works either with Paul. It's, I think of it as God's justness. So think J-U-S-T dash N-E-S-S, God's justness. It, it reminds me, whenever Paul talks about God's justness, reminds me a lot of the story back in uh, Genesis of Abraham, God coming to Abraham in the form of three somethings, people, angels, on his way down to judge Sodom and Gomorrah. He tells Abraham that he's going down to see if everything that he's heard about Sodom and Gomorrah is true. And Abraham asks God if he will spare the city if there are 50 just people in the city. It's the same term in the Septuagint as it is here in Paul. It's just God says he will, and so then Abraham lowers it, 45. We spare the city if there are 45 just people. And eventually he gets down to saying, will not the judge of all the earth do what is just? So there's this strong emphasis in this particular story on the idea that people can be just, and God is just. People do what is right. God does what is right. It involves an idea that's similar to holiness, but at the same time, it's somewhat nuanced. Paul thinks of this, just as the Old Testament does, as a characteristic of God. It's not just a practice. It's not a goal that God has outside of himself. It is an aspect of who God is. When we think of God in popular terms a lot of times, what is God? God is love. God is holy. Uh, God is caring. We come up with a lot of different 
ways of describing who or what God is. For Paul, one of the primary ways of describing who or what God is, is just. God is just. It's not that God aspires to justice that is outside of himself some way. God is himself just. And that's what leads God to establish a new covenant that makes people able to be in right relationship with him. Ah, okay. Actually, I thought I had about two more pages worth of notes to get through, and I don't. I'm, I'm actually doing a little bit better than I thought. Uh, let me summarize some of what we've said. Uh, reflect back on how Paul's ideas fit in with ideas that you see within Old Testament Judaism and then make one last mention of some of Paul's theology. Um, Paul's, Paul's underlying idea is that the law is not able to do the law is not able to really put people in a position to please God and therefore to be in right relationship with God. So therefore God makes a new covenant established through Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection so that sins are forgiven. The power of sin, death, is broken. The spirit is then given that transforms people into new creation or adopted as children of God and that empowers them to live as God wants them to. All of that fits in with what we saw way back in the second quarter when we were talking about Jeremiah and the exile over in Jeremiah chapter 33 I believe it is 31 or 33 Jeremiah talks about the fact that God is God is going to write the law on the hearts of the people that the, the covenant there's a new covenant that's coming that's not going to be written on tablets of stone there's a new covenant that's coming that's going to be written on the hearts of the people uh, and then they will be able to follow God's law. We didn't discuss it at the time, but the same idea is echoed in Ezekiel. The prophet Ezekiel, who's writing just a little after Jeremiah, basically echoes Jeremiah. He's, he says, God says, I think it's in Ezekiel chapter 37, God says, I'm going to write my laws in this people's heart. They will be able to keep my laws. I'm going to put my spirit within them. You see this whole idea picked up in Paul. Um, the old covenant was inadequate in that it was not able to, to make people able to follow it. It could tell you what to do, but it couldn't make you able to do it. Now, this new covenant that's been established through Jesus Christ allows the Holy Spirit to enter into the life of the one who believes, thereby making them able to please God, able to be holy as God is holy, as Leviticus puts it. So, that's kind of a really short and sweet, I know it took nearly an hour to do it, but it's really is kind of a short and sweet um, summary of Paul's evaluation of the law and this idea of the new covenant that's been established in Jesus. Now, next up, one last bit and then we'll, done. we'll be done. It'll take me five or ten minutes to do it so you'll get out a little early. Paul's eschatology. What is it that he thinks is going to happen in the end, and how does that affect what he thinks is happening now, or what he's doing now? We talked about um, the way that Paul oftentimes will solve problems by referring to his theology. Paul actually sometimes doesn't solve problems that we'd like him to solve because of his theology. An important part of his theology is the idea that Jesus Christ is coming back and Jesus Christ is coming back at any moment. Therefore, the main emphasis is on preaching the gospel, getting as many people to believe as possible because only those people are going to come into the kingdom of God. You see that really clearly in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, you see it in the background and you see how it's impacting 
the way Paul is talking about a particular problem that the Corinthians are having. Uh, they are wondering whether they should or should not marry. Now we talked about the fact that for one reason or another Paul is celibate. It may be that he's widowed, it may be that he's a divorcee, um, it's very likely that he was married at some point. And yet in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, he tells the Corinthians that he wishes that they could all be as he is. So they ask him, should we or should we not get married? He says, really you shouldn't get married. Nevertheless, it's better to marry if you're tempted sexually. Uh, because you're not supposed to engage in sexual activity outside of marriage. So if you just have to have sex, you get married. But I wish that you were all as I was. Uh, I wish you were. You could all be as I am. Um, what's lurking in the background of all of that, lurking as if it's a bad thing, right? Is his idea that Jesus Christ is coming back imminently. So why waste time, so to speak? getting married. If you get married, you're going to be concerned about your husband or your wife. Uh, part of my issue this weekend is my wife is sick. She has the flu. So I've been playing nursemaid all weekend and my concern is for my wife and uh, I'm trying to take care of her. Paul's argument essentially is if you're married, you're worried about taking care of your spouse. You're not going to do certain things in order to spread the gospel because you're concerned about your spouse. Therefore, it's better not to marry. You see the same idea lurking in the background in Philemon. Philemon is a very short letter that Paul wrote to a man named Philemon because Philemon's slave Onesimus had come to Paul because Onesimus had been treated badly in some way by Philemon and Onesimus wanted Paul to reconcile him and Philemon. Paul never actually says that slavery is a bad thing. And we've talked a bit about the fact that slavery was different back then than our experience of it was here in the United States. Nevertheless, it still wasn't a terribly positive social institution. And yet Paul never says really, Philemon, you shouldn't own other human beings. That's a bad thing. He encourages Philemon to release Onesimus, but it's based on their kinship within the new family of God. The fact that they're both Christians, they're both believers in Jesus Christ now. Well, what's lurking in the background of all of that is that Paul is not concerned about radically altering social institutions that he perceives as being fundamentally at odds with the gospel because those institutions aren't going to last long anyway. Jesus Christ is coming back. Therefore, focus on spreading the gospel. When Jesus arrives, Jesus will set those things to right. And that is not a major concern for Christians to be engaged in. So, Paul's eschatology, his idea that Jesus Christ is coming back imminently, affects the way he looks at other theological issues. I think I've said everything that I needed to say. We're wrapping up a little early, but that's basically because you're not able to ask questions. <laughs> if you had any questions, I want you to write them down, uh, and we can discuss them at the beginning of Thursday's class, if I'm here. Uh, maybe I won't be. We'll burn that bridge when we get to it and see what we're going to do. I don't know. I've got a lot of things up in the air, and we'll see how it all works out. So, uh, if I'm not going to be here on Thursday, perhaps what you can do is email me your questions. I can collect them all together and send out one long email answering all those questions at once. That will give you some additional material to use to prep. Okay, that's it. I'm closing down now. This is my first YouTube video. And uh, I'm going to go see if the Saints manage to hold out against the Steelers. Y'all have a good evening. See you later.